my apologies then for the initial glitch. It is my sincere uh, thanks uh, I, I, for the opportunity to speak with you today uh, and for the invitation. Um, I, I would have much preferred to come to Kyoto uh, to see you all. I, I was able to visit Kyoto um, a couple years ago oh. because my, uh, my wife's uh, family is from Kyoto. My wife is Japanese. Uh, I was, uh, uh, was born in Fukuoka and um, her, her, her family lives, lives in Kyoto. And so we, we brought my son uh, to, to meet his family some time ago. And it's, it's a, such a lovely city. I, I, I certainly have hope to have the opportunity to come and, and see, you, uh, see you again. Um, so the talk that I prepared today uh, on the theme of the, the post-Anthropocene uh, uh, tries to uh, uh, develop many of the themes that, that uh, were, were, just, were just mentioned uh, in relationship to some core ideas of uh, planetary scale computation. That is an understanding of computation, not just as a type of machine, but as a, uh, a, a, as, as a uh, global uh, phenomenon, uh, one in which that we need to understand as simultaneously a kind of technology and also as a kind of uh, social institution. And my first uh, argument I would like to make, um, and perhaps will also end up being the last uh, argument that I'll conclude with, is that some technologies, uh, their primary social effect or social function is one in which they allow us to do things in the world that we could not have done before. A, a hammer or a, 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 a weight allows us uh, to do things we could not do. Other technologies, however, their more lasting effect is in what they disclose, what they show about how the world works that we didn't know before, that we could not have thought before. A, a, a telescope allows us to understand the world and what it means to be in the world in ways that go far beyond its mere function. A, a microscope does the same. And I would argue that in the long run, uh, so does computation, that the real social effect of computation will have not to do only with what it allows us to do as a tool, but how it, it allows us to uh, understand the world uh, uh, differently than we would have before. Its epistemological function is more important than its merely technical function. Now, I will give a bit of review of some of my work for those who are, are not as familiar with it uh, as others, and to be polite in this regard. Um, this is the book that was referenced earlier, uh, a book called The Stack on Software and Sovereignty, which was published uh, 2016 by the MIT Press. Um, it tries to lay out a comprehensive political philosophy of planetary scale computation uh, and argues that uh, what planetary scale computation has done is, is not only transformed our geopolitics in its image, but has produced new territories as well. And the, it also argues that we can see planetary scale computation not as one single machine, but as composed of many different smaller uh, kinds of computation, uh, smart grids, uh, smart cities, artificial intelligence, uh, 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 and so forth, as combining to produce a kind of accidental megastructure. Uh, what we call the stack. And so in the book, I produce this model of, to understand that of an earth layer, a cloud layer, city layer, an address layer, an interface layer, and a user layer uh, that would specify uh, what that structure, the structure of that, uh, of, of planetary scale computation uh, actually is. And it is comprised in, in, in as a kind of interlocking, uh, interlocking and modular uh, superstructure. The, at the earth layer, there are ecological flows that become sites of intensive sensing and quantification and indeed governance. At the cloud layer, we see 
platform economies that create virtual geographies in their own image, uh, absorbing in many cases, traditional functions of modern states that are now provided by cloud platforms. Uh, and indeed, states evolving into cloud platforms at the same time. At the city layer, we see the vast discontiguous networks weaving borders into enclaves and escape routes, virtual addressing systems locating billions of entities and events into unfamiliar maps, an interface layer that provides vibrant augmentations of reality that stand in for extended cognition. And at a user layer, both humans and non-humans that populate this tangled apparatus, the accidental megastructure that I call the stack. The stack is also, uh, I should say, is presented as a, as a kind of platform. And much of the book deals with the, uh, the politics and economics of platforms. Now, platforms are characterized by a kind of apparent paradox. They operate through the standardization of, of, of modular parts, but through that standardization of a systematic standardization, they allow for an incredible heterogeneity and difference of possible uses. This is a, a technical description of platforms, but as I argue, platforms are not only a kind of technical system, they are also a, a kind of institutional form. And that we should respect and understand that platforms are uh, like states on the one hand or markets on the other hand, um, that they are a kind of, uh, a, of an institutional form that obey uh, rules all of their own. That is through the coordination of fixed protocols and standards, um, many different kinds of uses can be produced. For example, a search engine is a platform, but Google, for example, does not make the content on the search engine. They make the, they make the system that rationalizes the content on the, on the internet that makes the search engine useful. And it is the, that, that condition for the rationalization of what will happen next that is the basis of the platform. It's also the basis of the, uh, what, as I argue, the uh, political, many of the political implications of planetary scale computation. Now, this is not, this is sometimes thought of as a kind of futuristic story, uh, as about something that only might happen in the future. Um, it's, also, it's also a story of history, and it's a different, trying to tell a different history of computation uh, as a political technology. And some of the stories in the book have to do with previous uh, attempts to create societies through the integration of computational platforms. The two stories I go into greater detail on are the story of Stafford Beer, who in Chile, in South America, in the early 1970s, attempted to create a kind of cybernetic socialism in, in Chile through computational systems. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't work out when the, uh, the, the Allende government uh, was removed from power. Another one that I, I speak to in the book uh, as another example, much more successful, um, is that of Tron uh, in Japan. Uh, this is Ken Sakamura, what, the chief architect of Tron. Um, Tron was in the uh, 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 in, in mostly in the 1990s, but a bit before and after was what the most uh, widely used uh, operating system in the world, but not much outside of Japan. But it integrated, uh, as I'm sure many of you know quite well, um, industrial systems and consumer systems together uh, in ways that are, uh, uh, are, are quite uh, extraordinary. My point is that the idea and the understanding of computation as a form of social and political infrastructure is not new, uh, but it is one that has become a, the, the pressing issue that to decide and to talk about what kind of political system we want, 
and to ask what kind of computational systems we want are increasingly the same question. Now, it also affects the geopolitics of our moment. We are all probably familiar with many of the controversies between uh, the United States and China, for example, over 5G or data privacy and, and anonymization and so forth. In a more recent work, um, I discussed this phenomenon uh, and called this the, the development of multipolar hemispherical stacks. That is to say that there is the development of a kind of USA centric stack that also includes many parts of Europe, uh, the UK, Australia, it's not only the United States, but that it is a complete stack system that is under the in a particular geopolitical influence. There's also at the same time, a China stack, uh, which is not only in China, it's also in much of Asia and increasingly in Africa, that is also a complete stack, but one that is in what many ways uh, antagonistic or separate from the US stack. Now, the key idea is that just as we can't really separate the political and the technological at the scale of a society, we also can't separate it at the scale of geopolitics. The, the, the hemispherical stacks that, that are being built and the multipolar geopolitics that through which they're being built are in many cases, in many ways, the same thing. The multipolar geopolitics and the multipolar stacks are concurrent with one another. We also see then, um, it, not only the US and China, but a splitting of these uh, into increasingly uh, encapsulated domains um, that the, uh, the political influence of, of, of Russia or of China or, or of the United States and Europe uh, extends to their ability to produce data, model data, uh, and act upon that data uh, in ways that are exclusive of other stacks. So the question is not only uh, uh, how is it that these geopolitical entities use their stack, but how can we understand them that in many ways they are their stack. We also see this in discussions on artificial intelligence, which I will speak to in some detail uh, in, in a moment. Um, some years, uh, just a couple of years ago, as you we recall, there was a moment when every country and every world leader um, uh, issued a white paper on the future of AI. Uh, Xi Jinping's white paper of, the, of, of China's 2025 and then 2030 strategies uh, for AI as the core of their uh, geopolitical ambitions. Macron wrote one for France. Putin, of course, uh, wrote one and eventually um, someone wrote one for, for President Trump. But here, the explicit invocation of artificial intelligence, the ability to sense and model and, and, and structure data to produce a predictive infrastructure about the world is identified explicitly as not just something that states will do, but increasingly something that states are. And this shift, I argue, is, is extraordinarily significant and one that is in many respects, I believe, uh, underestimated in, uh, in, in political science and international relations, which still seem to think of computation as simply a matter of policy that it is something external to the government. It's something that governments do. And in fact, they need to see it as something that governments are. So let me then shift, uh, shift a little bit of gears to talk about this, the, the terraforming uh, uh, project, which we are uh, undertaking. Uh, and th this was mentioned a little bit in the introduction and, and, and pertains uh, directly to the, our, our, our topic. Uh, this is a, a think tank which I direct at the Strelka Institute in Moscow. Uh, we, the, the researchers from a, a previous think tank, the New Normal, um, from the Strelka Institute visited, uh, visited Japan a couple of years ago uh, for our, uh, 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 some of our research on, on robotics and automation. Uh, the terraforming, has, uh, uh, which is now beginning its second year, uh, has, takes this as its core project. 
uh, it is the comprehensive project. To fund, not, 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 this is not what the think tank is doing, but rather the terraforming is the sort of the larger initiative that we are all part of, uh, whether we wish to or not, of which we name the program after. That is the comprehensive project to fundamentally transform the Earth's cities and technologies and ecosystems to ensure that the planet will remain capable of supporting Earth-like life. Artificiality, astronomy, and automation form the basis of that alternative planetarity. So to clear up any misconceptions, the terraforming that we speak to is not to terraform Mars uh, or the moon like Elon Musk, um, but that in order for Earth to remain viable for Earth-like life, we will inevitably uh, have to uh, transform it, uh, transform the way in which we occupy it uh, at a scale that is uh, that is uh, a terraforming significant scale. Uh, I wrote a recently in, uh, in July of 2019, I wrote a sh much shorter book about 30,000 words that lays out the, the theory of the terraforming, uh, which is freely available as a digital download uh, from our website. Uh, the URL is theterraforming.strelka.com. Uh, which I'm happy to provide later, um, and you you can download this for free, which will lay out the, the work in more detail. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, one of the key ideas that we work with is around uh, an, a, 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 an embrace of the notion of the artificial. Uh, now, the notion of the artificial, as we propose it, is not as is the connotation in English can also mean uh, fake or inauthentic or counterfeit, and, but it can also mean, uh, and this is more the way we mean it, uh, something that is deliberately composed, that was made on purpose, uh, that was, was structured. And so this image, which is also from Japan, and you're probably familiar with it, uh, it's quite clear that, that there was an artificial intervention uh, here in the forest uh, that in such that would make these trees, not a photoshopped image, make these trees grow in this radial pattern. We can detect the artificiality of this. Our conviction is that the response, the successful response to anthropogenic climate change, man-made climate change, will need to be equally man-made, equally anthropogenic, and that the many of the uh, all cultures have some distinction between you know, nature and culture. And in the West, those distinctions, uh, I think, are in, in particular, are pr proving uh, uh, quite unhelpful uh, in, in, in understanding exactly how it is that we must artificially produce um, the, the, world that come, the world that comes next. In the West, as you probably are aware, environmentalism and ecological issues are often discussed in relationship to a return to nature. Uh, and we see this as, as probably the, uh, the wrong path. Now, to tie this to the question of planetary scale computation again, um, we, we make the argument that the, when we ask the question of what is it that planetary scale computation can contribute to the mitigation of climate change, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, idea that we must keep in mind and understand is that the very idea of climate change, the very concept of climate change, not, not the ecological fact, but the, 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 the scientific and cultural concept of climate change is the result of planetary scale computation, that without the sensors and, and computers and models and simulations that we can produce from all this disparate data, to, to arrive at this statistical pattern of climate change, the idea doesn't exist. And this is, I think, a, also a clue to an extent of what we should be using planetary scale computation for. How is it that a planet comes to know itself? We also take as a, as a given that the relationship, and I've hinted at this already, that the relationship between uh, technology and politics is one that's very intertwined. Um, we assume that uh, in many cases, the, 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 the future of a geopolitics and the future of a geotechnology uh, may be quite convergent. Um, and that not only is it what kind of geopolitics do we need to 
produce the geotechnology that we need, we are also at least open to the idea that the geotechnology may produce the geopolitics and the history of technology uh, may, be, may bear this out to a greater extent. As well, was also mentioned in the introduction, the, the, an emphasis on what we call the Copernican turn in design uh, is important. Now the Copernican turn or what Freud called the Copernican trauma is any, is any historical process by which humans understand themselves first un to understand themselves to be the center of a system and then usually through the use of a technology that discloses that the world doesn't work the way we thought it worked, uh, like a telescope, uh, they come to realize that they're not the center of the story. They're a little bit off to the side. They might be very interesting, um, but they're a little bit off to the side. And um, as opposed to what in design is called human-centered design, uh, we argue that a, a more fundamental uh, re-understanding of what it means to be human is necessary to this initiative. And for reasons we may not have time to get into, I, I, I feel that part of the problem, at least in the West, is that our philosophy of technology, um, in essence, wasted much of the 20th century uh, dealing with uh, uh, the work of, 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 of Heidegger uh, who, who, in my opinion, uh, should be read as primarily a, an evasion of Darwin, that Heidegger attempted to produce a history of being, a history of the human, uh, with refusing to engage with the, the scientific view of the human uh, through Darwin. Uh, and in many ways, this evasion is, is a kind of uh, the cause of a, a lot of wasted time. We can get into this a bit earlier, a bit later. Now, let me then talk a bit about uh, what we mean by, uh, uh, let's talk about AI. And I want, to, I want to give a kind of a very different definition of AI than maybe that we're used to, one that is probably less, more, more of this based on this Copernican turn. Traditionally, we think of AI as a kind of synthetic human. Uh, from Alan Turing, the British computer scientist uh, on forward, the, an artificial intelligence is a kind of artificial human. Um, I, I would argue that it actually should be seen in a different way, that it should be seen not as, um, not as, a, as a synthetic human, but rather as uh, an emergent property of matter. Uh, the planetary scale takes forms at different kinds of, different kinds of scale, obviously at different kinds of scales. Put simply, Intelligence is one it is an emergent effect of some of the ways that matter organizes itself. It can organize itself into organic systems uh, like the brains of animals. Um, it can organize itself into uh, interlocking systems like an ant hill. Um, but there are also ways in which rocks and metal with electricity running through them um, and with very small gateways can produce effects of intelligence. Intelligence is an emergent property of matter. Um, it, it, computation in this sense can be seen as a kind of a, a solvent, uh, a particular kind of, of sort of algorithmic reason that is not, not built into matter. It, it, it is, my argument is not, not panpsychism. It is not that intelligence is in the matter, but rather that certain ways in which matter can be organized produce this possibility of intelligence, produce the emergent effect of intelligence. So sapient, so the brain tissue of a sapient species such as humans um, is clearly one of the ways in which matter can organize itself to produce uh, intelligence and the effects of intelligence, but it is not the only one. And the key idea I wish to propose is that um, the real philosophical implications of AI will have less to do with us teaching machines how to think than with us understanding a, a wider range of all the ways in which intelligence can be produced such that we understand our particular version of it uh, along that spectrum with greater clarity. This is the Copernican turn, that we actually see it where we fit 
in this scheme because we now see that intelligence is not just human intelligence, it is also something else as well. Um, so we also see this then at the level of, we see this at the level, um, the level of cities where uh, the sensing, the sensor arrays and the means by which urban systems sense and respond to what's going on with them. This is also a model of artificial intelligence and one that is not based on the singular mind, uh, the way we think about intelligence for humans, but is more like a, a landscape, a forest or a jungle where lots of little intelligences act together to add up to something much bigger. So we would recognize then that intelligence and knowledge is always distributed among many different forms of life. Some of them similar, some of them dissimilar, and that no single neuroanatomical disposition uh, has a monopoly on this, that humans are not the center or the norm of intelligence. We are certainly amazing in our sapience, but we are not necessarily, uh, we're not necessarily the norm. Another way to think about this is there's lots of ways in which entities that, that also that, that, that AI is very much dependent on how it senses the world. When we talk of machine vision uh, and machine sensing and machine separation, this is another way in which we can think of uh, artificial intelligence as an embodied physical material phenomenon, not a, uh, a, metaphysical, uh, a metaphysical phenomenon. So um, let me then speak more specifically then to uh, the, 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 the conventional understanding of AI, uh, which we might derive from, from Alan Turing. So, uh, or begins in my little story from Alan Turing. So to be sure, I think that Alan Turing was is a hero, uh, one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century. But as you recall, but, but the Turing test is I think diverted AI philosophy in, in unfortunate ways. As you recall, the test is a, a thought piece, a kind of speculative design uh, thought experiment that he proposes in 1948 and 1950, in which he says, what if you, what if you take uh, two people, you take, what if you take a person and a computer and you put them in another room and you ask another person to ask them as many questions as they want, each of them, and to try to figure out which of them, which of them is a computer and which of them is a human. And he says, if that person can't tell the difference, then can we not say that there is in fact some form of intelligence really going on there? Now, he, what he means is uh, as a sufficient condition of intelligence. That is, if the computer can pass this, then we must acknowledge that there must be some kind of intelligence there. Unfortunately, in popular culture in particular, this has changed from what we call a sufficient condition to a necessary condition. That is, unless, unless, the, unless the computer can perform thinking the way that we think that we think, then it is not intelligence. And this, this modeling of AI as being, as being it exists to the extent that we recognize it as human is the problem. This has led us in lots of different directions. Now, Turing's own, Turing himself, the mathematician Turing was also a, was a, uh, was also had to pass. In other words, in Turing's test, the computer had to pass as a human. Turing himself also had to pass. In his case, as a straight man in a society that criminalized homosexuality. Um, and upon the discovery that he was not straight, um, he had to forego, undergo horrific medical treatments, um, that the, med the emotional pain of which was so great that he committed suicide. Uh, the, he doing this was also unknown at the time that he had also built the computers that had contributed to the winning of World War, the uh, defeating of Hitler's uh, forces in Europe. So we notice then a sour a sour irony between how an AI is forced to pass as a human in order to qualify as intelligent and how in, in Turing's case, he had to pass as a straight man in order to, uh, in order to, uh, in order to be free. I think part of the lesson here, the allegory is that 
passing, passing tells us much more about the success or failure tells us much more about the audience than it does about the performer. Uh, now, to, to extend this, the, the Turing test, of course, became a big part of popular culture. And if you are familiar with uh, uh, Ridley Scott's uh, 1982 film Blade Runner, based on the Philip K. Dick novel from 1968, what do androids dream of electric sheep? The film begins with the Turing test, uh, with what is called in the film the Voigt Kampf empathy test, which is meant to differentiate humans from replicants. Now, in the film, not the book, but in the film, replicants are throttled in two important ways. They're down, down, downgraded in two important ways. One, they expire after just a few years, but two, they can feel no empathy. They can feel no empathy. And so the test, the Voigt-Kampf empathy test is meant to detect absence of empathy, to detect absence of empathy. The Harrison Ford character, as you know, is supposed to retire the uh, replicants um, who have trespassed beyond their, beyond their situations. Now, by the film's conclusion, uh, Deckard, that's Harrison Ford, uh, he has clearly developed empathy for the replicants and for the replicants' desire to continue to live. Uh, and arguably they maybe have developed some empathy for him too, as we see the final film, the final scene where the, right, the replicant saves his life. But here's the thing. The Harrison Deckard, the Harrison Ford character, his dilemma is that in order to enforce, enforce the gap between the humans and the replicants, which is a gap that defined by what, the absence of empathy, the humans supposedly have the empathy, in order to enforce the gap and to retire the replicants, he must suppress the empathy that he actually feels for them. So in order to enforce the rule, he has to, in essence, violate the rule by having no empathy. Uh, the thing that supposedly makes him, uh, makes him uniquely hum human. And by forcing him to, to squash his own identification with the replicants, that supposedly cannot have empathy in return, uh, the principle of uh, very, the principle uh, of difference itself requires its own violation in order to maintain itself. Now, I think this is, uh, this is an, not only Deckard's position, it is in many cases, uh, in many cases ours as well um, in with AI. It, it is much better this is Paro, I'm sure you know. Um, there's much better to, I, I think, uh, to examine how this process of identification and counter-identification, how we project uh, anthropomorphic uh, empathy onto things that which it doesn't exist, then to demand that it do the same. That is, as with Paro, it is clearly much easier to make a robot that, that a human believes to have emotions, and that, that it loves me, uh, that, and for which in turn a human then has emotions for real because it feels them that, that aren't, that because it feels them from this projection. Much easier to do that than to make a robot that actually, actually has um, th those, those emotions. That is, the human may, be, uh, may feel love or hate from the AI, um, but he or she is reading cues more than de detecting feelings. So if we, we the, the idea that we should wish to define the very existence of AI in relation to how it mimics the way that humans think that humans think, will I hope look back upon in some years as a, as a, uh, as a kind of terrible detour towards a real understanding of what of, in, of artificial intelligence as this emergent property of matter that should tell us such profound things about what it means for us to be matter. We too, we too are one of the ways that matter organizes itself to be, uh, to emerge intelligence. Now, in terms of making AIs that are human-like, um, I'm reminded of the, 
of a, a quote from uh, Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig, um, who make the argument that what they call biomorphic imitation, that is making designs that work the way uh, something in nature works, um, doesn't really work. I mean, we don't, we don't, for example, uh, make airplanes that fly the way that birds fly. And we certainly don't try to trick birds into thinking that airplanes are birds in order to test whether those planes really are flying machines. But that in a way is what we're doing with AI. Now, to be sure, uh, the vast majority of AI research uh, is not focused on the Turing test or anything uh, anything like that is a real condition of excess. It, it really has more to do with the popular culture of AI that within Siri and, and, and Alexa and Samantha in her, the idea, the anthropomorphic construction of AI is something like the animals that talk like humans in a Disney movie. The only way in which we seem to be able to recognize any kind of intelligence there is through this very immature kind of uh, ventriloquism. So to put clearly, should complex AI arrive, it will not be human-like unless we insist that it pretends to be so because one assumes the idea of intelligence uh, that could be both real and inhuman at the same time might be seen as morally or psychologically intolerable for us. But instead of nurturing this bigotry, I think that we would do better to allow ourselves to, that, to see that in our universe, thinking is a much more diverse and alien uh, than even than our particular case. That, and that to, to embrace the idea that the real philosophical lessons of AI will have less to do with humans teaching machines how to think than with machines teaching humans a fuller and truer range of what thinking can be. Let me switch, let me move then to a bit of a discussion and a more specific discussion of relationship to how then, how then might we see ourselves in this relation? Not just how should we see the AI, but how might we see ourselves through the eyes of the AI? What might we learn about ourselves by seeing ourselves in this way? Now, a term for what I call this, what I call this is a term, what I, what I call this is the inverse uncanny valley. And I, I assume you're all familiar with Moshihiro Mori's uh, uncanny valley, um, which was uh, the Japanese roboticist who in the early 1970s coined this term, which is itself a kind of strange translation uh, into the in, into the into the English. But what began as a, a research in robotics and prostheses in particular um, becomes uh, an understanding of the re of, of an, in general a kind of psychological relationship to things that are greater that are more human like or less human like. And as I'm sure you know, things that are not very human like like the thing on the on the left, this doesn't cause as much harm. Um, things that on the, like the, the, the Android on the top right that are very, very, very human-like, we don't mind. It's this kind of guy on the bottom right here who is, who is human, who is human-like enough to be scary and to be bizarre. And so um, this uncanny valley of a kind of moment of psychological terror of improper recognition is what I mean. Um, so that is to say, in terms of AI and seeing ourselves in this image, we are in a way willing to let the future be strange and, un, un, and, and peculiar as long as it's not too weird too soon. And when things get too close, things get weird. But what do we learn from this? Now, what I call the inverse uncanny valley is is the op is the sort of the other way around. Not seeing ourselves, not being not being alarmed by how we see ourselves in the uh, robot, but alarmed by how we see ourselves through the eyes of the robot. 
the inverse uncanny valley is seeing yourself from that alien perspective, not, not our looking at something strange, but instead seeing ourselves through the eyes of that something outside, not as we imagine ourselves to be, but and yet as in a way as we are. So these demyst I argue then that these demystifying confrontations with, with the way in which we imagine ourselves to be uh, are not only psychologically instructive, they are crucial. Um, what, what the philosopher Wilfred Sellars called the latent and manifest image um, is that the, many of the most important scientific discoveries involve getting outside of our intuition of how we imagine ourselves to be and seeing ourselves through this kind of uncanny third person perspective. Part then of the, again, of the philosophical implications of AI is not just uh, what, how we can teach machines to think, but how we can see, or, and not only uh, how we can learn what thinking is through how they think, but to indeed learn who we are through how they see us. Um, now, in ways in which that this, in, in, in many different cultures, um, the, this is uh, culturally, this is alarming. Um, the distinction between what's real and what's fake, for example, uh, is a important, has important evolutionary uh, it, advantages for, for sure. Is this, a, is this a human or not? Is this a, simu is this a simulation or not? Is this real or not? Uh, and indeed, m arguably the politics of our moment is one in which the question of is something real or not is, has, uh, has become more and more difficult. Um, on the other hand, I, I, I believe that this, that for, um, that in many ways, the part of the legacy of the Turing test has also been that there is only one answer to this, that it's kind of either, or that either that bot is either that thing is a robot <clears throat> or it's a human. It, and if I look hard enough, I can tell the difference, but whichever it is, it is one or the other. The truth is it never is. It's behind the robot are always other humans and behind the humans are always machines that brought them there. It's always an amalgamation. It's always a mixture. Uh, and this is also part of one of the things that we need to uh, recognize in that, uh, in, in, in that positionality. Uh, you know, there's a reason why um, the US military um, uh, doesn't call its drones unmanned vehicles because there is in fact, no, there may not be a pilot, but there's a whole support team on the ground. They just happen to be thousand miles away. Um, and so that artifact is both human and technology at the same time. And this is always the case. It's all, we have always been cyborgs in this regard, but this is not so easy to absorb culturally. Um, in California, where I am now and, 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 speak from where I am speaking to you, we are trying to legislate against this reality. There was a, a law that was proposed a couple years ago called the bot law that would require that bots explain to humans that they are bots uh, when speaking to them. Now, given the fact that all bots are a mixture of code and real voices sampled and real conversations, they're always a mixture then the ensuing explanations as to exactly you know the metaphysics of the explanation for this uh, for this law may end up being much more complicated than than people really want to, um, but it also may uh, the point to, may end up being more uh, uh, point to more uh, Philip K. Dick like questions about one's own status, uh, uh, and and as you see here. Uh, the more you have to answer this kind of question, the less sure you are of the answer. Now, um, I, I, I want to no, I, I want to sort of go quickly. Then, you know, there's another point uh, on this as well, and I know some of the questions that we want to talk about have to do with some of the uh, cultural differences between uh, uh, Japan in the West, of, of, of Asian technology, te te techno cultures in the West in particular. Um, and I wanted to sort of raise this because I, I actually find this argument rather suspicious, um, but I wanted to put it on the table perhaps for, for a conversation. Um, Joey, Joey Ito, um, who was the, until recently, the head of the um, 
uh, MIT Media Lab, uh, and, and uh, offered a, an explanation as to why it is that um, in, in, in Japanese culture, certain forms of robotics are, are more culturally acceptable than they might be in other contexts. Um, that is that the uncanny valley is not universal entirely, that it, it, it is culturally specific as to what in fact constitutes uncanniness. And his argument um, is that it has to do with particular cultural and religious traditions um, from Shinto that, that, it, that see objects and matter uh, as already imbued with a kind of agency or spirit or intention uh, that makes the, the encounter with something that seems half alive uh, 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 with robots uh, less, um, less, uh, less, uh, less strange. Um, there are other others who who make the argument that it has more to do with Japan's immigration policy, uh, and that robots are uh, where some societies use um, uh, labor, to, immigrant labor, to do. Japan does with with robots, and but uh, maybe this is a point of uh, we can have some discussion about. Let me then conclude. Um, I want to conclude then specifically on this topic of the that I was invited to speak to on the post Anthropocene, and and on all, I will, I'll, I'll do so with enough time for us to have a conversation as well. Um, I, the arguments I want to make around the post-Anthropocene and, and this decentering or, or shifting in the logic of, of, of the human uh, uh, around this is, is I, I want to be clear, is that I, I, I do not mean that humans should have less agency. What I mean is that humans should understand the actual agency that they have. So the the, the, in a way, uh, the, it is about, it is against humanism more than it is against humans. Humanism being, I think, a kind of uh, misinterpretation of, of humans' own real agency. But to be clear, um, my, the call is not for the elimination of human sentience or sapience or a degradation of the rich cultural dramas, but to conceive, rather to conceive the world and to compose it, to compose it according to a model that locates uh, human consumption and production cycles with the care and specificity of a more dispassionate position. Um, as, as we say, as we sort of said that, that, that one lesson that we might take from the Anthropocene we, the post anthropocene from the anthropocene um, is that is that the what we call epistemic anthropocentrism that the point of the world is that it is here for us uh, this found justification in forms of humanism for which human experience of human experience of the world or just of itself was thought to present a, a deeper truth than a materialism for which we are one, but all, one, albeit lovely, uh, form of sentient matter, but not the only one. So the, the need to remake the model of the human, the idea of the human, that normative form, um, is in this sense a kind of ethical call um, but it's one that would, would, is, is not against the revelations of technology. It, it's real target is, 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 is humanism. And I say this as someone from, this, from that side of the, of the university. Copernican traumas, what I called Copernican traumas, that, 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 that rid us of the false, the illusions of a false centrality and specialness of human thought and human species being are priceless accomplishments. They are priceless accomplishments. Um, now, to the question of the post-Anthropocene of what comes after, really the only thing we can say, and I think the term is certainly one that uh, you know can mean many things, that the post-Anthropocene is simply, this is the era in which humans are no longer the dominant geological actor. Um, it may be because we were uh, replaced, we made ourselves extinct. Uh, it may be that we were replaced by something else, or it may be that we evolve into something that we would not recognize as human. 
But to, to go back to the earlier point, m- my argument, which should be clear, is that the dangers of the Anthropocene uh, has less to do with technology run amok than it has to do with the, this humanist legacy that argues that the world is there for our needs and created in our image. Uh, we still see this in, in, in we still see this everywhere, uh, and, and particularly in computing culture. And I find this rather uh, I, I find this rather alarming. Um, recently, a well-known thought leader in the world of American human-centered design uh, wrote the following quote: "It's time to invent a world where machines are subservient to the needs and wishes of humanity." And I find this deeply breath a breathtakingly stupid thing to say. First, it is tragically deaf, deaf to the lesson of the Copernican trauma, that our status as a dominant geological actor is fleeting, and that in order for us to survive, we will have to become something else than what we recognize as human um, in this way. Second, it props up, props up a psychotic mis recognition of what humans and humanity and especially humanism really are. Who are we? We are the brain eating apes with weaponized hydrogen atoms who organize our societies according to Bronze Age poetry on human sacrifice and ritual purification. Among the last, the last projects that we should champion is a is to support is rehumanization, at least in any direct sense of a return to historical norms. And I think, uh, frankly, many other species would agree. Um, recently, however, I, I spoke to a colleague, another some, someone well, also well known in the world of art and speculative philosophy who involved in his own way with a kind of project of theorizing the Anthropocene. And I was a bit alarmed by how much for him, the, uh, the absolute opposite was taken for granted. He, he, in short, he repeated quite joyously that the root cause of the ethical and ecological malaise in which we find ourselves is opaque, mysterious planetary systems and withdraw, withdrawn, uh, incomprehensibly complex processes. And so for him, the work of political art and design and philosophy is to re-render these small, these sprawling systems back down to a phenomenologically intuitive human scale, to rebind ecology to social historical time, a kind of psychological back scale everything down to our psychological comfort zones. The purpose of this, he says, is not is so that not only so that people can understand these in regular terms, but so that their abominably inhuman scope can be reformed. We could heal the Anthropocene uh, by descaling its unnatural complexities back down to a graspable, proximate, organic norm. If I can tell you anything, it is that this approach is absolutely the opposite of what needs to be done. The design that, that we need may, may provide for some uncannily practical pouts out of the Anthropocene, but it is absolutely not one in which the vast and impersonal and temporal and spatial scales of global systems are brought to heal, are drawn down into our, our intuitive neurological and emotional comfort zones. Now, that said, the the puzzle is not unscrambled um, just by reason getting its way. The means by which we get outside our our own prejudicial intuitions and and understand how the world works may also be the means by which we get outside ourselves and to see how the world works may also be the very means by which we undermine the world itself. That is, as I have, as I and others have written, the reason we know climate change is happening, at the nuanced degree that we do know it's happening, is because of the measurement capacities of the terrestrial and oceanic and atmospheric 
sensing meta apparatuses that are at least representative of the an industrial technological system whose appetite is responsible for the changes that it is in fact measuring in the first place. We know it's happening because the machine tells us so. Now, I worry that this correspondence may be more the rule than the exception. But maybe for our discussion, the real, the real better example is not between climate change and computation, but between oil and deep time. In the 19th century, finding oil uh, was a, an impetus for the excavation, the excavation of the earth, uh, an ongoing process that turns up sedimentary layers of fossils and provides evidence, provided the evidence of an old earth. It was the basis of the geologic science that brought us the idea of deep time. If not for the disgorging of fossil fuels since the late 19th century, we would not have this Anthropocene. And if not for the economic incentive to look below and at the rocks in this way, we would not have been confronted with the utter discontinuity between human time and planetary time. Mining made geology possible and geology made the unthinkable abyss of deep time a fundamental truth. So even if deep time is one of the ways that we learn to de-link human time from planetary time, its discovery was made possible by an industry that operated as it thought upon a nature that was somehow cooperative uh, with the idea that planetary time is subordinate below human time, but also by the accidental, the accidental fulfillment of that superstition by the actual binding of social and geologic time that we call the Anthropocene. What uh, Deepesh Chakrabarty and others have noted is that the Anthropocene can be defined as that binding making of planetary time run on the clocks of human social time. So to summarize, we dig for oil because we think the planet runs on our time, but because we did this, we learned that that was not true, but by doing so, we made it true. That is by pursuing the illusion as if it were true, we discovered as a byproduct that it was false and the byproduct of doing so is that we made it true. So lastly, what else do we know? And what else are we good for? If as in uh, Stanislaw Lem's Solaris, the surface of the planet, where, where in which the surface of the planet, you know the novel of uh, Polish science fiction novel, the pl uh, where the planet's ocean was sentient, the planet Earth's strategy towards sentience includes the layered networks of neurons folded into the gray matter of animal brains, particularly, but not exclusively, the cerebral cortex of primates, namely humans. We are, as the Russian cosmist Nikolai Fedorov wrote over a century ago, we are the medium through which the planet thinks. Having folded the planet, having folded some of its matter into the shape of brains over a long time, and then waiting a few million years for those blobs to sort it out. One of the things that the earth very recently learned was its own age. The earth is, as you know, for about 4.6, 4.7 billion years old. A confident figure for the age of the earth comes as late as 1953, the same year that Samuel Beckett debuted Waiting for Godot. We, the Earth's digestive residue, were able to discover and know the planet's own duration, its own age, which is quite impressive, which, which is quite impressive seeing how for most of our existence, we thought the planet ran on our time. 
So lastly, was this project in which the earth formulated from itself, was this project in which the earth formulated from itself a biochemical intensity, namely humans, that would prove capable of knowing how old it is? Was this worth the cost? This, this uh, Faustian bargain uh, to above all, was discovering the fundamental truth worth exhuming hundreds of millions of years of pre-Mesozoic biomatter for a two century fuel supply and inauguration of mass extinction? I asked my students this and, and they, were, uh, they were split. <laughs> Maybe the, the better question, and the one that I will leave you with is, what would make it worth it? What would make it worth it? What can we do now that would make it worth it? Must the accomplishment of a Copernican epistemic disenchantment destroy or at least threaten that which it knows? Is this a necessary outcome? Or is it only a provisional damage that we make for a more durable relationship between knower and known? The answer is not given in advance. We will have to decide it ourselves. Thank you.